what we're saying is AIDS happened. It changed society. It was huge. We were talking about sex. We were talking about gay men. We were talking about injecting drug users. We were talking about sex workers. We were talking about migrants and uh, immigrants. We were talking about something we'd never spoken about before so openly. We also, all of us who were living at that time, we had to overcome our own prejudices because suddenly we were meeting with people we would never normally meet. That was Ash Kotak there. Ash is a curator, a playwright and a filmmaker based in London. He lost friends and lovers to AIDS in the 80s and 90s and is himself positive. He's the founder of AIDS Memory UK, set up in 2016 to fundraise for and create a national memorial for all affected by AIDS in the UK. Ash will pop up throughout this show. Ruth is an NHS worker in Glasgow. In the early 80s, she had just completed her nurse training. She came out as lesbian at the same time and moved from her home in Clydebank to the larger city of Glasgow. I asked her what it was like coming out at that time. I, I never came out to my mother. I just continued to be me. And I remember having a very, very, very strange conversation with my mother because I, I have a son and I remember her saying to me, he must have been, this must have been the mid-80s at this point, and her sitting in the back seat of the car, um, driving somewhere, and her saying to me, do you know Ruth, I don't really care who you love or what you do, as long as it doesn't adversely impact my grandson, and you're happy, that's all that matters. I was like, whoa, here's me thinking, she doesn't know, <laughs> and she did, and, and they did, and I'm, I'm very lucky, um, because they were they just accepted me for me and that was fine. Madge describes herself as a tree-hugging dyke and lives in a women-only community in West Wales. In the early 80s, Madge had just finished her social sciences degree and was working as a home care worker in London. Like Ruth, Madge's mum was fine with her being gay, but her dad had real issues. My mum was a nurse, so she was, um, she was quite into me being gay. She was separated from my dad. Um, my dad was uh, the absolute opposite. He told his he told his Catholic Belfast family that I'd been raped and that's why I didn't have a boyfriend, which was absolutely appalling. I, I was shocked, you know, because I always thought of him as a bit liberal. Diana came out in the mid-80s when she went to university. She lost her family when she came out, but says she knew she had done the right thing. Oh, I knew I'd done nothing wrong. I made my choice about who I was and what I was going to be doing with my life. And they didn't see that way. I'm also Jewish. That had an impact as well. So I made that decision. I was hurt, but I wasn't devastated. Some people are devastated when that happens. I was hurt, but I wasn't devastated. I wasn't hugely close to my family. So therefore, and I came out when I was at uni first time, so I had a safe place to be. I wasn't frightened of losing my home. It took a certain inner strength from people and the amount of threat, I mean, I had friends. I remember one of my very first um, girlfriends when I first came out. Her experience of coming out was being referred to a psychiatrist and having um, having to undergo ECT treatment for years at the age of 14 till the age of 17 when she ran away. It, at the time it was freedom was just breaking out it was you were free to be who you were sleep with who you wanted as I say within the lesbian community it was like suddenly you were feeling free this is in my community in London this is not the wider country like living in somewhere like Truro in bloody Cornwall, you are not going to have the same feeling at all. But in my little community, it was like busting out in freedom. It was, we can be who we are. We can wear our badges. We can walk hand in hand with our girlfriend. We can kiss our girlfriend, the world. And it was that kind of attitude at that time. But then HIV and AIDS came along. And that also washed over to an extent on the lesbian community. Oh, 
lesbians, you're homosexual, therefore, have you got it? Elaine joined the Air Force in the early 70s and served for eight years. She came back to her hometown of Irvine in the early 80s, got a job in the buses, and says despite the homophobia of the time, she felt accepted by her community due to having grown up there. Elaine now lives in Iceland. When the AIDS crisis began, Elaine and her partner were still living in Irvine. So we started going to the gay group in air. And it was mostly boys. We were the only, I think at that, it, in the beginning, we, I think we were the only two girls in the whole group. And we used to meet in people's houses because it was taboo, especially after AIDS started circulating and people didn't know anything about it. And being gay was bad enough, but if you possibly had HIV or AIDS, then it was a nightmare. And we had a meeting once a month now, I don't quite remember the timeline. It must have been about 83 going towards 84. People were really, really worried. Not only the boys, but the girls as well, because nobody knew. Although they were saying it was a homosexual disease, they didn't know if it, girls could get it or women could get it. I should say, I shouldn't really be saying girls all the time, but that's just a habit. Um, Nobody knew. When I was nursing at that time, and it was really, really weird because we knew about we knew about AIDS because we, we saw things in the news. There was no social media to look things up. There was no internet to look things up. So you didn't get very much. You got selective information that came through the media. Um, and you didn't have, at that point in the 80s, you didn't have um, the charities that were taking up the cause. Because they didn't have the information then either. There were, you know, I think Stonewall was formed in the late 18s, early 90s, I can't remember now. I, you know, and there were um, movers and shakers that started to, to do that. But at that point, all we had was, in, in healthcare, all you had was, if somebody tells you they're gay, then you must barrier treat them. Um, because you treat them as other infectious. If you were a nurse or a doctor, and you were a guy, if you're a woman, you were just ignored. You know, there was no such thing as gay women. <laughs> but if you were a gay man and you said you were gay in health service, then you were not allowed to perform surgeries, to be involved in surgeries, to do women dressings, to do anything where you would be in contact with body fluids because they didn't understand. They didn't understand that not everybody's gay would have the virus, but also they didn't understand the transmission and all that kind of stuff around the virus at that time. The 80s was just about before latex gloves were even a thing, you know. Yeah. But home helps had their marigolds and they took them from from client to client. There wasn't, you know, you didn't even, like, throw away your gloves. <laughs> I contacted the STD clinic at Ayrshire Central and I spoke to a doctor there and I asked the doctor that I spoke to if there was anybody willing to come to a, a very quiet meeting with some gay people. And this guy said that he would see if any of his colleagues would. Anyway, a couple of months later, it was arranged that this doctor would come and speak. So for the next three months, this female doctor came and tried to tell the, the group what she knew and what the pos possibilities were and how bad was it and all the rest of it, at which time they started giving out free condoms and uh, various different talks and everything like that to try and make life a bit better. But the boys were terrified. First, I was um, a home care worker uh, for the Westminster County Councils um, because the home helps refused to go in to the gay men. I mean, I don't want to put them down, but yeah. it, in that day, in those days, it was a very poorly paid job, home helps. Mm. You went in, you did a bit, I mean, it still is now, isn't it? Mm. They're called care workers now, aren't they? But you do a bit of cleaning and you do a bit of dinner. Um, but they, I suppose, a bit of their homophobia or, or their fear, and it kind of caught on. And then once one or two refused to go in, it sort of, became a thing and and the gay men didn't really want them either you know they were little 
middle-aged women what I am now probably but <laughs> you know um who were kind of fussy and busy and poorly paid and trying to get on with their job and get out and um these were young people that were dying you know they weren't they weren't used to working with young people when I first sort of like came out as uh, a lesbian in the mid to late 80s um, my first experience was talking to a woman on the lesbian strength marches and then I got involved in switchboard that was then London Lesbian and Gay Switchboard, there's now Switchboard, through the auspices of someone called Lisa Power, who is extremely well known within HIV and AIDS field for the work, immaculate work she's done within those and setting up a stonewall. So she was like my mentor in Switchboard and I learned about HIV and AIDS in Switchboard because we had specific training, of course, and we always ended the every call with the safe sex message. So it didn't matter who it was, male, female, non-disclosed. What we said was, please remember safe sex, always use a condom on toys or whatever else you're using. And then I went along to a meeting of the Pan London AIDS Consortium that it was then, which was at Lighthouse, which was... Uh, a place in London where a lot of HIV and AIDS patients went. So I got involved with that and I started volunteering there as well. And I would read to the patients who had lost their sight and also take them to the garden. There was a sensory garden where they could touch plants and smell plants because obviously they couldn't see them, but they could touch and smell. And so I would sit with them and talk, chat about what was going on in the world. Uh, the LGBT world, that is, because obviously they would get news, but not our news, because especially then there was no our news other than Pink Paper, Capital Gay and stuff like that. And then I became a, one of the buddies. So I would look after a gay man whose family had abandoned them, do their shopping, clear up, tidy up, remake the bed for them, help them bathe, things like that. But there was a lot of lesbians at that time doing the same thing. Yeah, so, you know, we would see the same guys. There was 12 of us on the team, and we would have our clients. Maybe we'd have seven or eight clients. We had shifts, so we so it had an eight till four shift and then a, a 12 till eight shift and then a night shift. So we could be on call at any time. These guys could phone us up. We had a little petrol allowance to let us drive cars and stuff. And then go out to them if they were stuck, help them out. And then when they got ill, um, we would sort of stick with them until they died, really, visiting them in hospital as if like a family member, because lots of their families had rejected them. And one of my clients was um, from Cornwall and his whole village had got up to get him out, you know, had sort of chased him. Don't know if it was literally with pitchforks, but it kind of, you know, chased him out of town. They thought it was, a, you know, a disease that, that Sodom and Gomorrah had brought on itself. I went to my very first London Pride, and it was in Brixton. Now, I don't remember when it was, but I remember it was in Brixton. And I wasn't really paying attention to the Pride March. I was just looking everywhere because it was so different. And I remember one particular, we passed these two women and one of them spat right in front of us. And I just couldn't believe it. And I says, what are you doing? You dirty homosexuals, you, you spread diseases and all this. Gay men in particular in the 70s, 60s and 70s, and in the 80s when it was decriminalised, led what to the outside looking in would have appeared like a very hedonistic lifestyle. They have a particular culture, they have a particular way of engaging. So what? <laughs> but there was there was a genuine, and I, I believe, and I don't know whether that's right or wrong or, or not, but I, I believe there was there's a genuine chip that we carry around our Christian culture 
um, and, and that whether you, it's somewhere in the back of folk's psyche, they think that this is the sins of the behaviour visiting on them, some, you know, that type of thing at the time. I don't want you near my kids. There was a lot of that going on. But also the lesbian community took, to a large extent, took HIV and what was happening to the guys really seriously and really supported heavily the gay guys. I'm going to say, you know, I, I supported um, a guy who I was a mentor to in switchboard when he lost his partner. So that was bad. You had funerals of someone you knew or their partner had died and you went to the funerals. And some people just wouldn't go to the funerals. So it was really bad. And then we had all the stories of the flat was in the name of the guy who died. Relatives came along and threw the other partner out because they said, well, it's not his, it's ours. There was the partner not being allowed to visit the partner in hospital because the family didn't want them to, or the hospital staff wouldn't let them because they were regarded as not family. There was a lot of stuff going on around there. And it was police as well would turn up on a raid. With, you know those gloves where they put, them, do, put their back, arm up a cow? Police would turn up with gloves up to their shoulders masks all over their face this is to raid a gay club which didn't shouldn't have been raided in the first place the gay scene in the 80s had the misogyny and gay men were, were every bit if not more misogynistic than straight men within the um, the gay scene now for whatever reason there's all sorts of um, social research went into that around you know lesbians and gay men and how they all proceed all that kind of stuff around identity and how there was a oil and water stuff going on with our identities. I was a trainer at Switchboard as well and you used to take your volunteers along because a lot of lesbians had never been to gay male clubs. A lot of gay men had never been to a lesbian club. So you would basically take your volunteers, male and female, to a gay club and then take them to a lesbian club. The club knew beforehand that you were going so they weren't too shocked at those three or four gay men coming in with a group of lesbians. But so you would do that and we went to one um, drag club and we all went in and the female volunteers were abused by the drag artist that was on stage at that time. Um, something I oh look, there's a load of fish just come in the door. We must never forget, ever, that when a lot of gay men were so fearing in the 80s, and you, we know this, but it needs to be said continuously, it was lesbians who helped us and gay men. It wasn't gay men. Gay men were dying of AIDS or too scared or too scared to admit it. That, you know, if you even admitted that you were doing anything around HIV AIDS, a whole lot of people, and to this day it happens, people will run away from you because they don't want to be associated with HIV in case something's HIV positive. The women never, ever, ever did that. I don't know one woman, one of my friends, one of the female friends I had who did not come and help. There was a change in the way a lot of gay men look, but not all. You must remember that there's still a certain amount of misogyny within the gay male community towards lesbians now. Um, but there was a change. It was a good change. It was more accepted to have a for a gay man to have a lesbian friend, to go to places together and stuff. I had a lot of gay male friends at the time, and they were really great guys. Because I was a nurse, I had a lot of... Um male gay friends because traditionally that was where a lot of them ended up was in nursing or in medicine or some sort. That was, they, they, they walked right into the stereotype and there was a crowd of three of us, uh, three lads and two women that we used to kick around together and one of our colleagues who was a nursing officer at the time, he was the first that I knew who died of it. He never told any of us. He never told any of us. He... Um, told us he'd went uh, to take another job, disappeared, and then we were told by his family that he died. And that was awful. And it was the shame. The, sh the shame was just so overwhelming. People approach me and say, you know, I've never told anyone that my son died of AIDS. Ever. I said he died of cancer or something or other. It, I was, I suppose, being kinky, I wasn't experiencing the shame. I'd been out since I was 17 and happily mixing with uh, lesbians and gay men at 
nightclubs. And so I felt that they were my kin and they were in trouble. And I had a bit of a, I don't know, got a bit of a mother complex probably. And I wanted to help. I wanted to look after them. Sometimes it's difficult to say why you feel impassioned to do something. But seeing the guys at Lighthouse, these fantastic men with great experiences, great lives, being abandoned by people, I just felt that it was something I could do. And so I wanted to do it. I didn't, you didn't tell anybody at that time what you were doing because people still would think, oh, well, if you're dealing with guys that have got this, then you must have it too. So you could lose employment, you could lose friends, people wouldn't want to be near you. When, when um, our son was going to secondary school, he always used to say at parents night, please, can you take out all your earrings and make sure you look like a mum? And that's because Section 28 was in and we couldn't have both went to parents night. It would have been illegal for um, our son to be taken away from us because we were two women and all you would have needed was a, a teacher to complain. That's all it would have taken for there to be some sort of social work inquiry and then somebody decided that they didn't like her lifestyle, it wasn't healthy for the child, especially a male child and all that nonsense. It was what you knew, it was what you accepted almost as this is the way things were, This is you, you fought for change, you fought for you know equal age of consent, you fought for... Uh, against Section 28. You, you know, there was all these fights going on as a community that you did, but other things that were happening, you knew that they were wrong, but it was also what you'd been brought up with. That was the normal. It was the wrong normal, and you fought against it, but that's what you knew. I suppose because I lost my family through coming out. So I think perhaps that's part of why I was so willing to put myself in their place of what would happen to them. So that was part of it. And just, there was such an enormous need. And there was a lot of people volunteered to do the work. I was, you know, there was, I'm just one of many. I worked in ACT UP for a while. Um, you know, it's a volunteer thing. Mm-hmm. So we had an office in Brixton and um, it was like an activist group. Um, at the time, there was a lot of, the government was supplying don't get AIDS messages. They were busy trying to protect the straight population, so-called straight population. And um, so what was happening was once you got HIV, everyone was like, oh, don't want to touch you with a barge pole sort of thing. So ACT UP were trying to get services, good, adequate information to people that actually had tested positive and, you know, living with AIDS, unleashing power. That was their Keith Herring's little... uh, uh, meme or whatever it's called now um, about you know act up to lit to unleash power like trying to get people who were positive and PWAs to get active around demanding their rights and uh, calling into question the the you know ignorance dying of ignorance thing horrible messages that the British government were putting out. Tory government. Later on, I became the um, the group counsellor for the um, body positive women's group, and in that, in it was in women that I saw that where, especially Ugandan women, they would say, "I was never, I never slept with anyone apart from my husband," and how come I got it? You know, they couldn't understand what that meant. And they were very ashamed because they felt like there were all these, you know, that like I think that the gay men's thing was they were really angry about being called ignorant. Don't die of ignorance. What you want about? Like, we know more about it than you do. It, It isn't ignorance that they died of. Their own ignorance. They died of the hospital's ignorance. But, um, the, the women had responded to this thing about, you know, the, promiscuity that they were being told that you've got it from promiscuity and they were very you know older women like probably my age now I remember one of my clients Mary you know before she died saying I you know I never slept with anyone apart from my husband 
And she was, that was really, had broken her, you know, that, that she'd been told it was to do with promiscuity. She was a, you know, Catholic woman in, from Uganda. And anyway, oh, I'll tell you what really had a massive impact was Lady Diana going to the AIDS ward. And because before then, the AIDS ward, you know, it was like you never went there. It was like you kind of knew where it was in the hospital, but you didn't go in. Yeah. And, and, and the papers are turning up. It's St Mary's, it was, in Paddington. And her touching someone, it had a massive effect on our jobs because after that, People started, you know, really, um, I don't know, they they opened up, they loosened up, they chilled out. Mm -hmm. Before then it had all been like, oh, my God, what a horrible job and maybe they deserve it and maybe they brought it on themselves and maybe you can catch it from toilet seats and all sorts of bullshit like that. You know, I've got no truck with the royal family, to be honest. Even Lady Diana left all her money to rich people. But, you know, her doing that, her physically touching someone changed everything for you know the funding started to become available we could send people on holiday we could pay for people's flats you know it, it changed everything I think because we had a bit like the way the pandemic's front and centre on everybody's minds just now HIV and AIDS not so much in the 80s because although that's when it, you know it was, it was more prevalent you were seeing what black retrospectively you could see what was going on in America we weren't so aware it was the very late 80s, early 90s that we started to see that and we started to get the TV hype and we had a very focused, concentrated effort. You know, there was leaflets through everybody's doors, so there was all of that stuff. But all of a sudden, you know, five years after that, everybody believed, although there wasn't a cure, we had a preventative solution, we had education. There we go, job done. What's the next issue? AIDS ended with the medication suddenly the war that no one believe, would believe would end. So 15 years later, it happened. That so much so that no one really noticed it. It wasn't a celebration like the end of the Second World War. It just gradually, it was, it was, it was as if nothing happened. No one believed it. And then suddenly people started grieving. Think of a movie. So, you know, you have a fight or a car scene in a movie. That stops the drama. It's only when the car chase has ended and the fight has ended that the drama can continue. That's exactly what it was like for us living through HIV AIDS. We, you didn't have time to think. You, you've been to so many funerals, you didn't have time to grieve. And after that, after 1996, we then grieved and it was unbearable. <laughs> 